I'm Jamie Elman. Uh, I may or may not be related to Ray Elman. It depends how much he's worth. <laughs> what can I tell you about me? Um, I am. Uh, I was born in New York City and raised my uh, first 24 years in Montreal, Canada. I'm an actor. I'm a musician. I'm a writer and director. And for the last five years, I've been working with my partner Ellie Battalion on the world's first ever 18 and over, or as we like to say, Chai Plus, Yiddish web series, Yid Life Crisis. Um, both Ellie and I grew up in pretty traditional um, families in a traditional enclave of Jewish Montreal called Cote St. Luke, which ironically means the embankment of St. Luke. When I grew up there uh, around the corner from Ellie, unbeknownst to us, um, it, it was 99% Jewish. I mean, one of the most densely Jewish areas in the world. Um, we went to Jewish day school, we went to Jewish high school, we went on March of the Living, we had bar mitzvahs, we went on um, every, we finagled every free Israel trip that we could milk the community for. Um, and uh, that first 18 years was, uh, it was, it was very Jewy. Um, not religious, not orthodox, uh, but not reform. Uh, a traditional, what we'd call conservative Canadian, you know, so it's like conservative in Canada probably leans a bit more orthodox compared to the States. Um, and uh, there were seeds of the crisis, of the religious crisis happening to me from early on because, for example, I went on March of the Living, right, this trip to Poland and Israel when I was 15. And I came back and um, wore a kippah for the next three years because going to, uh, you know, the, the, the camps when you're 15 and it was very heavy, it's still heavy, but it's when you're 15 it's... and. Um, I won't go too long into that story, but I ended up wearing a kippah for the next three years as a proud Jew that I needed the world to know that we are, I'm Jewish and we survived and, but I was not at all religious. I was eating treif, I was, I, I mean, whatever you could do to be goyish and then and, and, and follow none of the laws, that was me while wearing a kippah. So right there you could say I was already, you know, struggling with this kind of thing. Um, and then uh, uh, the, the next 18 years, the next high of uh, my life was spent in the world of media and entertainment. Um, when I was 18, I got my first uh, agent, or 17, I started doing movies and TV. Uh, and it had, uh, you know, nothing to do for the most part with um, Judaism, although I kept on finding my Jewishness creeping into the parts, like I played a part on a TV series called Student Bodies, a Canadian teen sitcom. It had nothing to do with religion at all, but when the Christmas episode came around, the creators of the show said, you know, we realized that your character has to be Jewish. Why? Because I, I, I emanated. It was like coming out, I, I, you know, it was already there. And, um, a big part of my upbringing also was, uh, was, was comedy, was sitcom. Seinfeld was a huge part of my life. Mel Brooks and Woody Allen was a huge part of growing up. Now, I don't think that I associated them with my formal Jewish education at the time. It's only in hindsight that I realized that the great rabbis that I studied under I'm speaking of Rabbi Larry David, Rabbi Jerry Seinfeld, Rabbi and Joan Rivers, Paul Reiser. I mean, I could, the list goes on and on. You know, Billy Crystal. I mean, whatever. I, there are, there, you know, there are many, many um, were extremely important to my understanding of Jewishness, Jewish culture, Jewish identity. It's a lens into how Jews see the world. Is is our our sense of humor and our our legacy of comedy? So even though you said something about you know J Jews take themselves seriously, I mean we do and we don't. Some do, of course, the ultra orthodox do, um, but w w we think that we are probably representative. We meaning Yid Life Crisis of a whole swath of you know contemporary Jews who might not see it as a crisis. We call it the crisis, but you know it's about how are we going to live Jewishly. So all things considered by the time I was an adult I was fully atheist, hedonist, heathenist, I could go on but let's just my parents might see that I don't know whatever I'll stop there. The point is 
Uh, I was certainly not religious. In fact, I take a lot of issue with all religion, all organized religion, all religious dogma. Um, and yet, I cannot separate myself from my Jewishness. I mean, it's just something that you realize by the time I hit uh, double high, you know, I was what I was. I, I, it's part of my DNA. It's like I said, it's part of my outlook on the world. I think it comes from my Jewish education. You cannot separate me from that Jewish education. And sort of to the point of your question a second ago, one of the reasons why I think we could get away with being a little bit outrageous, depends what you call outrageous, but you know, the opening scene of our very first episode was us eating poutine while the Kol Nidre is playing on the, you know, and it's Yom Kippur, and he, I'm trying to get him to eat, and all that. For some people, that was sort of shocking, you know, that like, well, and we're speaking Yiddish. But the point of the Yiddish was, uh, sorry, I'll finish what I was saying, that um, we could get away with it because people see that it clearly must have come from a place of love and a place of education because we, we couldn't poke this kind of fun or have this level of sort of nuance in the things that we're saying if we didn't really understand what it is that we're tearing down. So I was excited to tear it all down in such a way that people watching would also understand that, well, we must love it anyway, you know, and, uh, because it was a lot of work to do it. More work than people realize also because of the Yiddish, which I don't want to burst anyone's bubble here, but I don't really speak it. We did learn Yiddish at Bialik High School in Montreal. We were lucky to do that. Yiddish in Montreal is a part of the fabric of the city. A um, hundred years ago, it was the third most spoken language in the city after English and French. We learned it at Bialik a little bit for five years. Ellie had it before me when he was in elementary school and grew up with his grandparents in the home and they spoke Yiddish. But for us, it was more about the idea, or for me, it was more about the idea of taking a, a language which was either considered dead or dying or only preserved really now by the ultra-Orthodox community who I disagree with on almost everything. And who I'm not even sure they think I'm Jewish half the time or if they pass me on the street in Outremont or in the Mile End in Montreal and they're all streaming out of the, you know, and I say, good Shabbos, and most of them don't answer me. I don't even know, you know. Um, I was excited to go use their language, which in fact was not at all a religious language for the preceding 800 years before the Holocaust, per se. Right? It was the language of daily usage, of secular life, of business. And um, it just turned after the Holocaust, and it became this thing that was only preserved by the ultra-Orthodox. So it was exciting for us to do something in Yiddish that was going to be profane and challenging to the status quo of, you know, Judaism. And it was also about showing the world to an extent that, you know, Jews are not all black hats. I mean, we're not a monolith. We're very varied uh, peoples. And we, we wanted to sort of show off how weird Jews can be. We could be speaking the ultra-Orthodox language while eating, you know, bacon. As long as the bacon is extra crispy, that makes it kosher. The beauty of the internet is that we put this thing out thinking that no one would ever see it and within a few days we were getting emails from uh, Melbourne, Sydney, Berlin, Buenos Aires, all over North America. And generally um, we, 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 we tend to sort of have two demographics, there's sort of a younger skewed, and by younger I mean let's call it, you know, 25 to 40 or something, and then it's like 65 and up, we do pretty well there, you know, two people who miss hearing Yiddish, their grandparents spoke Yiddish, their family, we, we hear a lot of, of course, the same tropes around the world, but, you know, my grandparents spoke Yiddish so that they could tell secrets in front of us and, and you know, stuff like that. Um, I don't know who we thought we were making it for, honestly. At this point, I could say, I think we may, we, we, we keep the audience, the umbrella Jewish audience in mind, but we also try and do things that we just think are funny and that w help us work through the crisis. What's the crisis? It's the crisis of Jewish identity in the modern world. How do you square your religious upbringing, your honoring of your grandparents' rituals and your ancestors' traditions in the profane, secular, technological, heathen world that we live in now. Atheist world that we live in now. That's the crisis and I think that 
even Orthodox people who see it get that that's the crisis. Because let's face it, the, the Jewish identity crisis, I mean, God and Moses or God and Abraham talked about had the same crisis, right? Why me? Don't pick me. I don't want to be involved, you know. Um, so, um, and, and questioning everything, of course, which is probably our favorite thing about Judaism is that, you know, not only is it okay, it's inherently part of the very concept of Judaism to question everything. To your question about, you know, who are, you, you know, uh, some of the reactions or, or feedback from some of the people who might be offended by it, I think our general feeling on it has been the people that would be really offended by what we do don't see it. They, they, they just don't watch YouTube and it, it won't get to them and it doesn't matter. On the other hand, the ones that have gotten to it, who have found it through, you know, their Talmudic loopholes where, you know, you can't watch it on YouTube. But if somebody sends you a link via WhatsApp, it, okay, that's also the crisis. The crisis refers to the hypocrisy. So we know that if they're watching it, that they're already being hypocrites by even watching videos on YouTube, in which case they must be, agree with us whether they like it or not. We, I ran into a religious guy in Utrecht, in Montreal. We were shooting our movie, Judaism, about Jewish Montreal. We were doing a piece on the Hasidic community in the middle of Montreal, and a guy came up well, he saw us at the cameras, and he said, what are you doing? And we're looking for uh, the owner of this shop to talk to. And he said, well, he was looking a bit, uh, you know, as, as they tend to do, a little bit suspicious. What do you want? Who are you? Why the cameras? And I said, well, we're, 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 we're Yid Life Crisis. We make a comedy, you know, online. And this is a hardcore Hasidic guy with, you know, Payas, Tzitzis, Black Hat. And I say, you know, it's okay. We make this show, Yid Life. He goes, oh. You're the guys that eat the uh, tray from the Shabbos. <laughs> How would you know? You're not supposed to have seen it. Um, people ask us if, we, if, if, they, if, if, if we get in trouble, but really we don't. People, I think, get what we're doing, that it comes from a place of love, that these are all questions that have been asked since the dawn of time. What is a Jew? How do you live Jewishly? What does it even mean? Why do we care? What should we preserve? Which babies should we keep and which bath water shall we flush? It's really from the 18 years of indoctrination in the Jewish day school system. And I taught Hebrew in LA for a while as my side job and bar and bat mitzvah classes and stuff like that. And, you know, we didn't have, it wasn't that. We weren't doing Sunday mornings for two hours and learning, you know, like, you know, um, Shabbat, Shalom, or, you know, whatever. We did that too, but that was kindergarten, and then we learned Hebrew, and then we studied Tanakh, and then we, you know, um, and, and I suppose to an extent we, uh, we, we try and stay a little bit literate on these things, but um, we also, it's not, we, we will go to rabbinical authorities to get references. We, when people tell us things, when we're just traveling around or doing our live shows, you know, somebody might say something that just, you know, sparks it for us. Um, it's not necessarily... Um, uh, biblical references, but we're, we are trying to draw on whatever the entire combined breadth of whatever we've picked up in our lives, you know, can go in there. So we could reference Seinfeld and and Rambam, you know, in the same uh, in the same episode or something. Um, we've referenced you know Hillel and Shammai, the you know the rabbinic uh, Talmudic uh, scholars. Um, we 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 use let's put it this way: we show off the references that we know. And we also know that we know a fraction of what many, many people know. And sometimes, you know, we'll get comments about this or, you know, you know, it's the kind of, th I don't know. We did, we did one where we, we've only done this one time where we had fake Hasidic Jews walking through the frame. And we were talking about them. It's season one, episode three. It's called Great Debates. Go watch it. Sign up for our YouTube. Follow us on Instagram. Follow us on Facebook. Sign up for Twitter. And... Um, and we saw these guys who were actual, you know, um, uh, Haredi guys driving by in their minivan, obviously, and and they were slowing down. And we thought they were going to shut down the thing. And they were looking at our guy, and they were giving us like stink eye. And then finally, they put down the the window and they yell out at us, "Wrong socks! What? He's wearing the wrong socks. These are Shabbos socks, and his weekday hat." <laughs> And so the you know, and uh, so there, yes, there's a certain level of uh, people that will understand things. 
I, I'll say that we also try and do something which has made our lives a lot harder, but we hope it may, it's made the experience of the show overall better, which is we try and layer it in such a way that there is something for everyone. One of our mandates from the beginning was not just entertaining Jews, but we got this grant from the Jewish Community Foundation of Montreal, right, from, you know, Federation, from the establishment community, and one of the mandates of the grant was, as we say in Montreal or in Quebec, rapprochement, bridge building, bring communities together. So how did we do that? We hired non-Jews to shoot it. We had a non-Jewish crew. We had French Canadians with us in the restaurants hearing us speaking Yiddish. It was also one of our first glimpses into the idea that this might actually work beyond the Jewish community because as we were sitting there performing that first scene in Yiddish, one of the French Canadian crew members was laughing. Now, he didn't speak any English. Therefore, we can assume he doesn't know any Yiddish. Okay? And that's because he's French Canadian. Okay? And he was laughing. And I said, What are you laughing at? Because he hadn't even read the script. And he said, In French, he basically responded, It just sounds funny. It sounds like Seinfeld. Okay? And that, I know I can have reference Seinfeld a few times here, because that is maybe, you know, we get it's like that. That's Talmud for me. Like, I was learning that at the same time in high school that I was learning Bible or. You know, everything else that I was learning. And again, I didn't know that it was so Jewish or, until I realized that it was and, and how much that's uh, played into stuff. So we do try and uh, as smoothly as possible, not always successfully, um, to educate. And we are proud of the fact that we hear from both non Jews and even Jews. Sometimes converts, sometimes people who are married to non-Jew, and they say, uh, you know, I understand my husband better now. You know, my wife understands me now that she's watched your show. You have to hear us kvetch at this very high level of kvetchitude that allows people into the sort of the Jewish psyche sometimes, you know. Or people, they can't understand why Jews do this or that, and then they see us making fun of the fact that, yeah, there's kosher food, and we have kosher plates, dairy plates, and meat plates. We also have treif plates. We put our bacon on treif plates. But you're not supposed to eat bacon. Yes, but if you're going to eat it, it better be on those plates. Do not put the bacon on the meat plate. You know what I mean? And it just, it's just, it's nonsense. It's a complete absurd thing. No, of course you don't understand it. We don't understand. Nobody understands it. Everyone picks and chooses. And so our thing is, we like that. We endorse that. We say, everyone, live and let live. And pay. So part of it is trying to explain Jewish rituals or customs to the non-Jewish world. Part of it is illuminating it for Jews. We do J for J, we call it for shorthand, jokes for Jews. There are things in there that we know that the rest of the, the, the non-Jewish world will not get this reference. We, you know, we feel part of this thing that we didn't know we were getting into when we started, which you know, people say like, so is there a Yiddish renaissance happening um, around the world? And it's sort of one of these, you know, it's like when five years ago I would have said, yeah, we're part of the Yiddish renaissance, you know. We, yes, we are singularly responsible for saving the Yiddish language. <laughs> It's not true. Um, it never went away, and uh, but we did discover that we're part of some sort of uh, moment that Yiddish is having right now, right? It's playing in Fiddler on the Roof in New York right now in Yiddish. It's been extended for a year. It's like completely sold out. Um, there's Klezmer's having a moment right now. You know, they did a, a Klezmer concert in Central Park last summer. We're hopefully hosting the one this summer and a couple months from now in Central Park. They had 5,000 people listening to Klezmer in Yiddish, you know. Um, and I guess we stumbled into this Yiddish moment and this uh, sort of Yiddish renaissance. Absolutely. I mean, the thing about Yiddish also, th th this is misunderstood sometimes, and now I've, uh, I think we're trying to have a, a more sophisticated understanding, because a lot of times Yiddish, in, e even for North American Jews, even for Miami Jews, are, it, you know, is like, it's just the curses and the schmutzy words, and it's, it's like all a big joke. And so there's this thing that comes out of it, which is, you know, Yiddish is just funny. But what people interpret that as is sometimes mistakenly is that, you know, Yiddish 
is like a cutesy, you know, pigeon language or a fake language or something like that. And it's it's completely not true. I mean, there's like literally a you know thousand year tradition of Yiddish literature and music and film and poetry, and it's like it's a serious language. Having said that, it's also an incredibly colorful language, and yes, some of the sounds of it are inherently funny. But also, when we talk about the sort of funniness of Yiddish, we're ta we we think we, we we actually shot an episode of Yid Life Crisis, the first one in English and in Yiddish, just to do the experiment and sort of see what happened. And it's just, of course, it's funnier in Yiddish. Yiddish is more expressive; it's more colorful. It it, it affected our performances completely. Like we started. You can't help but just become, start gesticulating wildly as you, as Jews tend to do. So, pretty quickly once we um, released the first season of episodes, which were just four episodes of five minutes each, um, we immediately had like an international response because that's the beauty of the internet and people are craving. Um, you know, y Yiddish content and they're craving comedy and, you know, we think that we can use this sort of, uh, as we like to call it, the Trojan horse of comedy to get our rapprochement in, our bridge building, our edutainment, okay, and all this stuff. Um, and we started getting invited to present our work in various cities around the world. So, um, you know, we, we, we started with sort of a premiere in Montreal where we screened the four episodes and did a Q&A and sort of some live shtick. And this quickly sort of snowballed into doing a live show, which we've now done all over North America, um, coast to coast. And also we, we've brought it to other places. So as we started to go around the world and do our live shows, we'd also then start exploring the Jewish communities where we were. And at some point, pretty early on, we said, you know, we're having really interesting conversations. We're eating some amazing Jewish food. People are feeding us. So, you know, that's artists who will take it. Um, and we are really learning some fascinating things about the Jewish community all around. And so we started a sort of ancillary series to Yid Life Crisis that we call Global Shtetl. And we started out doing it in a five-part mini docu-series um, on Tel Aviv, looking for the themes of Yid Life Crisis. Yiddish, Yiddishkeit, cultural, Ashkenazic food, etc. Um, and, uh, and, you know, how, Jew, how Jews are, are, are being Jewish in, uh, in various places. Um, so we started with this five parts in Tel Aviv, then we went to New York. Then we ended up doing it as a four-parter in London, doing the London's East End and, and meeting the, uh, the cool young Jews, as we call them, newish Jewish of London, who are guys like us who are making, um, you know, plays, um, comedy, podcasts, um, you know, we spoke to this girl, Rachel, at the uh, JW3 in London, who's our age and who's uh, conducting a musical directing a Yiddish choir. Um, and so we started documenting these things. Another big one we did was in Krakow. Um, obviously a fascinating, I'm not obviously, it's, it, we come to realize it's a fascinating Jewish community in Krakow made up predominantly of non-Jews who are running that community or people who are only recently discovered that they are Jewish, that they found it on their grandmother's deathbed, that they're Jewish, and you know, you can imagine the complicated history of the Jews and the community in Krakow. We did a movie on that, Narishkeit, Yid Life Crisis in Krakow. So this sort of kept going to Toronto. By the way, all of these can be found on our YouTube channel that I mentioned. You should subscribe to our YouTube channel. And, um, and so we call it Global Shtetl, and it's a look at the Jewish world through our personal lenses. And we'll do this when we're in a place doing our live show anyway. So that's how Judaism came about. We realized that we've now done all these different cities, Detroit, you know, and even this one really hurt, Toronto. That's a rival city for Montreal. Is Toronto's kind of rival city with the rest of Canada, but we love them. You know, we got a bit of a love hate thing going with Toronto. So, anyways, but they were just kidding. We love Toronto. They brought us in, um, and we shot a uh, fun little three part mini documentary on Kensington Market, which is the old Jewish market. Uh, uh, immigrants come to Canada often ended up in Kensington Market. We explored the market. We talked to rabbis. We talked to Rastafarians. We finally said, "This is crazy. We've never done this in our own hometown." 
You know, we've paid tribute to Midlife Life Crisis is in part a love letter to Montreal. All of the episodes take place in Montreal, not the global shtetl stuff, but the episodes, you know. Um, and so in honor of the centennial of the Jewish Federation, we got a grant to do something in honor of the, the 100th year of Federation. And that turned into uh, Judaism, a taste of Jewish Montreal, telling the story of the last hundred years through Montreal's iconic foods. And why do we think this is perfect? Because it's sort of beautifully, you know, um, it, it's sort of a beautiful emblem of, of, of the Yid life and the crisis because Montreal and Jewishness are actually interwoven. You know, the Jewish community in Montreal is, uh, is part of the reason why the city is what it is today. Culturally, uh, definitely culinarily, you know, the, the things that Montreal is known for, bagels and smoked meat, Jews brought them to Montreal. So that's just the tip of the iceberg. So, but we started with this idea of let's just eat our way through the city and tell the story of Montreal, of Jewish Montreal, through these six meals that will sort of follow the hundred years. And we were just, uh, you know, blown away by the response. People really liked it, and um, I think they they can see that even though it's a love letter to Montreal and our city, that it's in fact, of course, a universal Jewish story or even a universal immigrant story about a people that comes to the new world and tries to make a life for themselves there and brings their recipes with them, and that's how it starts. Yes, uh, this is a new world for me. I mean, Yid Life was a total joyous surprise um, for the 20-ish years leading up to that. I know people say, you're not old enough for that, but I am. I am old enough for that. I was in a professional actor. I've done a lot of TV. I saw all the movies. I did. You saw I did some movies. I was on Curb Your Enthusiasm. That's my... Uh, it wasn't my longest job I ever had. I've been on series where I... You know, I was on a series for three years, a couple of times, uh, but Curb, Larry, Rabbi Larry, it was a bit, you know. Um, so I wouldn't mind getting back into that. I also had a great experience over the last um, couple of years. Do you guys know the play Bad Jews? Mm -hmm. uh, started off Broadway, I think, in 2012, written by this guy, Joshua Harmon. Anyways, it's, it's a, it's a four-person play. It's a really good show. It quickly, that year that it came out, became the most produced play in North America. If you ever get the chance to see it do, I'm sure it's played um, all over Florida. And I just got to play the lead in that in uh, Montreal. We did two runs of that and then we brought it to Toronto. We did a third run of that over the last two years. And that was actually my first time on stage doing a play in like uh, eight years. And before that it had been 15 years or something. So. Um, Theater is a whole other thing. This is part of the fun of doing our live shows is that we work so hard. We schwitz via schlove like a slave um, on these episodes and then we just send them out there into the world and we don't, you know, who knows what. And part of the fun of doing our live shows is that we screen some of our work for hundreds of people and we get to hear the live reactions. And I really did miss being, you know, miss that live uh, reaction when I when I started doing um, Bad Jews, which I guess I did a, you know, a few hundred times, it, the energy of a live audience, I mean, there's just, there's just nothing like that. So we'd love to do, you know, do more theater. And, um, you know, my Yid Life partner, Ellie, um, he wrote and directed his first feature that uh, came out recently called Happiness and um, I'm very proud of him and I uh, think maybe I'll try my hand at directing some more as, as this goes along. Basically I direct most of the episodes we do here and that's been a very new world to me and so I'd like to pursue more of that and um, I don't know, are you hiring? <laughs> the fun of this project and why I'm so grateful that this is happening and that you even want to talk to me right now and that anybody wants to talk to us is that Yid Life has brought sort of all of my disciplines together into one thing. So we do things like I'm going right now to do the talk and it's more of an educational or academic discussion. Tonight we're going to the JCC, we're doing our live show Yid Live. We sing, we play instruments, we stick it up, we interact with the crowd and you know whatever. Um, we do our scripted videos that are, sometimes people think we're improvising in Yiddish. Uh, uh, uh. I wish I could do that. We 
we bleed over every syllable of these things. People don't realize, and that's why we're very happy when we win writing awards, because that's, in a way, that's the hardest part, you know, to get these things in such a way that, um, that, that people can watch them over and over again and still hear new things and various things. We really like that, so um, that sort of thing. But then also, you know, with the success of Judaism, we're realizing, wow, we're, we can make documentaries, and that's great, that's great fun, too, and really get to meet people, talk to people. I mean, you, you're, you guys are in a, you know, our documentarians, you're interviewers, you know how it is. You can have some really fascinating conversations. Do you go to the right place, meet the right people? And so we've been really enjoying that, too. So I, I, I don't know, I mean, all I can tell you is I... Uh, when we first put out those first few episodes, we did not really believe that anybody was ever going to see them. Like we, were like, we made a Yiddish web series. You know, even when we were talking about it, people they're like, "For who? Who's going to watch that? Nobody speaks Yiddish. You don't speak Yiddish. How the hell are you going to even do this?" I don't know. We just think it'll be interesting, and we could not have imagined that it would be this. I couldn't. The Betsy, hey, the Betsy. They put me up for free at the Betsy South Beach. Huh? Who knew? There really isn't. And I've had to put many other things on hold. We've managed to sneak a few things in. Like I said, somehow Ellie made a feature. It was a indie feature and he shot it in like 11 days and it's Miss Sugar that he pulled that off in the first place and the play um, you know it was crazy when we when I was rehearsing the play in Montreal and then we were moving to Toronto and the whole cast moved over to Toronto and I stayed back in Montreal to shoot the next episode of the show and then came straight from the airport right into rehearsal the next day and it's been hard to juggle all these things but I'm not complaining because having been uh, an actor for 20 years and at the mercy of the business of my agents and the managers and waiting for the phone to ring um, you know as uh, oh what the hell I'll just say it as an artist because I never really considered myself an artist I'm an actor I'm an entertainer but to just get to just to just to just to stick with the plan just to be your own boss and to make your own work and to not have to answer to other people has been worth whatever the tourist has been whatever the not being able to do other stuff yeah I had to turn down some things I couldn't I can't audition for things that are shooting in three months from now because we have already gigs lined up right now for Detroit and DC and Philadelphia in three months from now. Okay, so, um, but it's worth it because um, it's been very rewarding to make it this far in a business and in a life in entertainment and then finally get to sort of take the reins of the career a bit. So I'm not complaining. I'll ride this out for as long as possible. Having said that, if you have any work, you know, call me. <laughs> Ellie and I are the entire organization at this point. Even the tickets that are being sold, we made a deal with the uh, with various organizations like JCCs that will just bring us in. We're not getting a cut of the ticket sales. We just want to put on a good show and make sure everybody laughs and entertains us, uh, or laughs and are entertained, and then they bring us back and I get more free nights at the Betsy. Uh, also downstairs, the the steak at LT. Oh my God, that was. The food. Uh, How about those popovers? Oh my God, the popovers. The popovers. That's your signature. <laughs> Let's just say it was worth the trip just for those popovers, but um, because we're this and want to bring us out to hire us to do the live show, and we do, what we've now become sort of, um, you know, it's morphed. Like Yid Life Crisis was a web series, but now we consider ourselves to be Yid Life Crisis. We are the brand. We are the duo. We are the whole uh, kit and caboodle, and people hire us to do fundraisers. We just hosted the Beit Food Sought International Gala at the Mandarin Oriental in New York. The, things that we wouldn't have realized, but now we're sort of on the comedy, the Jewish comedy scene, and so we could lean into the comedy side of it, or we could lean into the academic side of it, and you know, we'd love to, and we get emails all the time asking, you know, can you guys put out your scripts in Yiddish, can you put out the transliterations, the transcriptions, you know, why did you translate it, like, we, 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 we feel that we want to do a whole program that, that's educationally unpacking what we did in Yid Life, because we get questions from all over the world all the time about the, the Yiddish and how we do the writing and how we do the translating and, and um, we do take it all pretty seriously so we hope to get to do that soon too. We would 
be very open to that. We're, we're always looking, uh, it's hard to find them maybe because we're weird, but for the equivalent of us in other cultural communities. You know, like we've done episodes where we try and, you know, where we had an Indian guy who converts and then he's back, you know, he's, he's and we, of course we turn it into a whole snipping his schmeckle joke at the end, but, but you know, but it's, it's we, we're looking for, for our equivalent in other communities, obviously in particular in the Muslim community would be good. You know, we want to do Eid life crisis, you know, Christ, cr Christian life crisis, or, you know, the, the, the crises of identity or how to be Jewish or Christian or Muslim or just an ethical person, these are things that we all think about all the time. So we think that interfaith versions of Yid Life Crisis would be great. If you want to put us in touch with those people, you know, there's like the Muslim... It could be for my... If we get this grant, it's a $300,000 grant. Uh, I, you had me at three. <laughs> so, so uh, as you were talking about it, I, I wouldn't approach the Baptist or born-again uh, community because they don't have a great sense of humor. No. And they have guns. <laughs> yeah, no. Duly noted. 